Just to start off, guys, you know, looking back on that 2000 Gold Cup, you know, what does that, what does that tournament, uh, you know, mean to you? What are some of the the memories? The what do you remember most? What are the things that stand out most about that tournament from a memory standpoint? Uh, Jason, kind of, you know, let's start with you. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you most, I guess, kind of remember and cherish from that experience? Yeah, it was a very surreal experience. I think the, f- the first round was probably the most peculiar first round I've ever been involved in. in probably in Gold tournament. Cup history. Probably in Gold uh, Cup it, history. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, every game finished in a draw. It, you know, it was decided on a coin toss. I mean, I, I've never had that experience in my life, but uh, I still remember. Sit, standing in the back of the tent that, that was set up um, beside the stadium and, and Hol Grosiek, our head coach, was at the front doing the coin toss and all of us were at the back and, and Holker just looked down at the coin, looked back at us, gave a thumbs up and, and we just went nuts uh, and, and we were through. Um, and, and then we, we realized, you know, we we're through the knockout stage, um, a, a big slice of good fortune, but from that point onwards, the knockout stage onwards, it was like a snowball going down the side of a mountain. By the time we got to the final, it, it almost felt like we were unstoppable. And I remember before the game saying to the guys in the dressing room, like, we've got nothing to be afraid of. Let's just go out and play and just have fun. You know, we're, we're, we're playing against Colombia. We're the last team from CONCACAF. So we knew we'd already qualified for the Confederations Cup the following year. Uh, and we went out and played with freedom and, and it was the most enjoyable game in a national team jersey I think I've ever had. Mm. And uh, when the final whistle went, it was pandemonium. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty surreal experience in the final for sure. Yeah, very, very bizarre. And, and, and I believe I think through 2002, I wasn't a part of that team. I, I was going through some illnesses, but uh, I think we, draw, we had to draw straws to get out of that one. Yeah. <laughs> that was a three-way tie. So. Yeah, it was really bizarre. We were the game, uh, we'd already played our both our games and Costa Rica and South Korea uh, were playing each other. And then we're watching this thinking, hold on a minute, like everything is tied. Goals for, goals against, head to head, everything. So we're hearing there's going to potentially be a point loss and that was the case. Um, I think it was initially thought of that they were going to do it behind closed doors and all those jackets like not a chance we're doing that we're on, yeah. he was he was hovering right over top of them making sure there was no shenanigans uh which there wasn't and yeah and he just put his hand up and went, yeah, okay, we won, we won the quarterfinals <laughs> yeah just to add to that i mean i remember us standing at the back of the tent and jason if you recall i remember we, us saying you know it's and no disrespect to our country and we love everybody that supported us and, and were with us we thought thank god it's not a canadian taking the coin toss because we'd probably lose <laughs> and because because holger was taking the coin toss we win we move forward and like jason said it was just almost like a train taken off from a station and basically we knew that it was going to take something special to stop us and even that Trinidad game, which probably ended up being our toughest game. Mm-hmm. And at that time, they had some very good players yeah. playing abroad. And we we found a way to get a result. And uh, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. And the biggest thing I think I take from that team was definitely the camaraderie. Everybody was involved in everything we did. The history has shown us that, uh, you know, the U.S. and uh, Mexico really have been the, the, the yardstick for everybody to reach to try to be competitive in the Gold Cup and CONCACAF. And for us to do that, it was difficult. Uh, obviously, the, the, the talent, too, uh, was uh, high because of the invitational teams. South Korea, Colombia, yep. Peru were in that tournament as well. So it was a high standard. Um, we as a nation have uh, struggled to uh, score goals most of the time. Defended pretty well, we were a pretty good unit that way. We would compete, um, but we would really struggle to put any kind of length or uh, string of games together that would be competitive enough to win a tournament. And Mm -hmm. we have struggled since then as well. But the stars seem to align uh, uh, from really the opening games to the coin toss didn't play particularly well against Trinidad in the semifinal, but we managed to score on our one or two opportunities that we created against Columbia. I thought it was our best performance of the tournament uh, by quite a stretch. And I think it just worked out well. The rain, the wet surface, I yeah. think the Colombians struggled with that. 
uh, the pace of the ball and the surface early on. We were quite comfortable. A lot of people on our team are playing in Canada and uh, Europe and used to wet conditions. So, uh, yeah, everything just seemed to work out really well. The stars aligned. We had a terrific group of uh, players that would show up, win, lose, or draw. And uh, we never really felt we would probably do something so special. But it certainly was an amazing uh, thing that none of us will, will ever forget. Mm. What do you think was the the match or the moment where you guys, where y'all started to realize that something really special was happening, that something special was brewing? Would you, or would you put it at the at the coin toss, or was it more when you came back to beat Mexico, you know, who was a three-time defending champion at that point? What was that moment where you're like, where you guys were looking at each other like, wow, something really special is happening here? I think it was Duisburg. Is that where we went with Holger the very first training camp? I yeah. think it started there because I think he brought in a mentality that, and again, no disrespect to the forefathers, but he brought in a mentality that we had never had. So when we had like a German like Holger come in and implement this from the very first start when we went to Duisburg, you kind of knew there was a shifting of the guard. There was a, there was a change in mentality. There was a, a belief in, in what he was doing and everybody was buying in. So I take it back to there. And then in the tournament, for sure, I think when we, and it, it, it'll kind of sound funny, but I think it was the very first game because every other time we'd played against a very good CONCACAF team going down, we found a way to beat ourselves or not capitalize on a few situations. But in that game, somehow we managed to get a 2-2 draw. And I think from that point on, we believed, you know what, we could probably do something here. And then of course, the Mexico result created a bit of more resolve and belief, and then it just kept going from there. And, and, and that was a that was a tall task. I mean, if you look at, at that squad of players, yeah. most of us, aside from Carlo, Paul Pescasolido, one or two others, most of us played in a defensive role at our club uh, around the world, whether we're playing in Europe or in North America. So we were a team that was very, very well organized defensively. Um, but we, we knew that we couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mexico from an attacking perspective. So we, we went into the game with a very clear game plan. And, and we conceded the first goal, but we, we never came out of our shell. We, we, we sort of played the, the wait-and-see game. And, and, and then when Carlo equalized, was yep. it the 82nd minute, I think, Carlo? 80, something 83rd. Around there. 82nd yeah. or 83rd. Um, yeah. I think the Mexicans were just stunned. This wasn't the script that they were used to. Um, no. And they were expecting us to just fold up tent and go home, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or even, even worse in many respects, chase them and, and go after them. And I, I remember losing my voice, screaming at Carlo to, to drop and, yeah. and try and stay as compact as we could because we knew that, that if we were difficult to play through, there wasn't enough space behind for them to go over us. And, and we, we knew we were in the fight. And, and so we managed to stick to that game plan. And then obviously we equalized. It went to, uh, to sudden death. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the, the goal, it was not a classic by any means. It was a classic counter-attacking move. Uh, not a great finish from Richie Hastings, but uh, it doesn't matter. It hit the back of the net and it, it, it'll, it'll always be the greatest goal of his career. And I think the belief started to grow. You know, when, when you beat a team like Mexico, who is as strong as they are and have been for, for many, many years, the belief starts to grow within the camp. And, and in the semifinal, you know, as Carlos said, we found a way to win. Forrest was unbelievable in goal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. throughout the whole tournament, but he was just incredible against Trinidad. Um, and, and we managed to squeak a goal at the other end and hang on for victory. So, you know, as fairy tale stories are written, uh, you wouldn't have scripted this one because I don't think anyone would have believed it at the start of the tournament. It's, you know, it's not lost on me for sure. Uh, I know the power, the strength, the ability of the Mexican players. I always love playing against the Mexicans, their tactical awareness, their game management. To be able to beat them and compete uh, was, was really pleasing. So y'all get to the semifinal against Trinidad and Tobacco. So uh, another opponent that uh, that you know that's a very good opponent. They had the, that great generation of players, of course. Um, you, the finals within sight. You know, if you win, you're in the final. So you know, what's the mindset heading into to that game for Canada? Yeah, it, it was it was actually difficult because. It was a little bit like after the Lord Mayor's show. We just beat Mexico, which we'd never, you know, this group of players had never done at the senior level, uh, certainly not in a competition uh, like the Gold Cup. So it was, a, it was difficult to get ourselves back up again just right. a few short days later. And, and I, 
look back on the game, I don't think we played very well. <laughs> I really don't. Um, and I think Trinidad, you know, maybe felt a little hard done by, but but as I said, we had Forrest in goal who was incredible uh, throughout the tournament. And that game specifically, uh, almost single-handedly got us through to the to, to the final. Uh, Carlo was always a threat throughout the tournament up front. And it was it was you know Mark Watson who scored the goal um, that, that got us through. And you know the one thing that we we were uh, as a group was very resolute, very determined, very committed, very hardworking. Uh, and, and we knew we were on the, the edge of something pretty unique. So um, it, it wasn't a classic, but <laughs> like with every goal that goes in, it doesn't have to be a classic. They just sure. remember who wins and who loses. So, uh, you know, ultimately we did enough to get through and, and, and got to the final where we played against Colombia. Yeah, and, and I remember it as, again, Bruce being such an influence. He says, guys, this is our final. Because it was basically the two CONCACAF basically whoever won this was going to go and represent CONCACAF so we knew we knew that and as Jason said we didn't play well but the one thing and you know the one thing Canada can stand for is obviously over time we've always defended very very well and we've always had amazing set pieces but when I look back to actually that team the delivery whether it was Jim Brennan or whether it was Martin Nash was always very 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 good and then we had guys that could attack the ball like even you know, leaving us two out of this, Jason, we had the Mark Watsons, we had the uh, the Paul Fenix, we had so many people, even Pesci as a small guy could mm. leap. Like, so we knew that if we could create that opportunity to get one or two corners, one or two wide free kicks, that eventually we would get something. And that's how we ended up winning. You guys, I, I think you mentioned earlier, it felt like you were outplayed, but you save a penalty and it was really like you, it was almost like you knew you had to step up your game. Um, you know, for your team and, and you did that, you know, what was, when you're, when you're in a pressure situation like that and you're having to save a penalty, what's going through your mind as that, as that happens? At that moment, I didn't really think much about it other than trying to figure out a way to uh, get the best of the player. Uh, Carlo played with that particular player in England and he ran in and gave me some advice. He said, um, okay. they, uh, I think he said he goes to, he'll go to your uh, left every single time. And oh, wow. And so I went to my right and saved it. <laughs> well, and then see, see, the thing with that is too, is that obviously the, the, the player, I can't remember his name, was t who was taking it, who Carlo knew. Now all of a sudden he knows that yeah. Carlo's told him I go one way all the time. So now I'm going through, now it's a mind game thing. So, uh -huh. you know, so a lot of people sure. are like, yeah, Carlo Corazine must have gave you some great advice. And I said, the way he did, he absolutely did though. <laughs> It all worked out okay. Well, Jason, so you guys, you get to the final, you're playing Colombia. You know, this is a Colombia looking at their squad. It's a good squad, like, you know, Tino Aspria is the captain. I mean, a lot of good players on that Colombia team. Uh, you know, what do you recall about the, the, the final against Colombia and the way Canada played in that match? Yeah, I, I we said earlier, I, I think it's the best match we've ever played. And certainly in, in, in my time on the field, and, and I just look back on it as being one of freedom and, and free flowing. And we didn't have a care in the world. We, 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 we just played with, uh, with an openness that I don't know that we've ever really had to that point. So, you know, I, I look at, you know, we remember looking across the tunnel at them as we're walking out. It wasn't a nice day. It wasn't hot. It was raining. It was miserable. There were about maybe 6,000 people. And I think five and a half thousand of that was your family, Carlo, uh, <laughs> in the stadium. So, you know, their motivation, they were probably looking across thinking, this is like a training match for yeah. us. Why are we here? What are we doing? So, you know, they were, they were less than inspired, I think. But, you know, we took advantage of that. And, and ultimately, you know, you still have to do the job. You still have to win the game. You still have to win your individual battles and, and play as a unit. And we did that on the day. So, you know, we came away, I, I feel, deserved winners on the day. And, and the celebrations afterwards were, uh, were, were something we'd never experienced before. Every single professional, I believe this deep down in my core, never steps on a, a field to not win because Columbia did. But deep down in their heart, they were an invitee. There was really nothing there of substance for them except to say that they went in and won a CONCACAF tournament that they were invited to. So I'm not saying that they didn't try, I'm not saying, but if you put together, again, the game plan that we stuck to, we stymied them. Again, Greg Forrest stood on his head, stopped the penalty. Um, but we just played as a unit. By this time, it was, 
as I had mentioned to you, those foundations that Holger had put in, by this time it was like we knew where everybody was in every situation. There was no hesitancy. There was nothing like that. It was just free flowing, like Jason said. I think it was the best and on the other side, the most comfortable I felt in an international game. You win the Golden Ball, you win the, the MVP for, for the tournament. Just on a personal level, what did that mean to you? Somebody mentioned it the other day to me that nobody in their confederation or goalkeeper has won the MVP since 2000. You're the last goalkeeper in any of the confederations. But it is, yeah, it's kind of looking back on it, thinking uh, it, it was rather surprising that a goalkeeper did. So, Carlo, when you see this current Canada team now, I mean, they were they were spectacular last year in the Gold Cup, set a record. Can I can I play on this team? Can I play on this team? Can I play on this team? I bet you, I bet you, John, John can find a place for you some, somewhere. I'm sure. Uh, but when you, know, what, what are your thoughts on this current Canada team? I mean, you know, you have Jonathan David banging in tons of goals last year in the Gold Cup. Cavallini, you know, they're setting records for goals scored in group stage, hat tricks. Well, of course, Alfonso Davies, everything that he's doing. You know, Carlo, what's your what's your feeling on this current Canada team? Well, my feeling is, by far and away, the best attacking team Canada's had that I can remember. Um, just the options and, and, and the ability of those options to not only play and go forward, but to mix and match the options. I mean, just it's, it's the depth is way beyond anything I've ever seen with the national team. Wow. I mean, so obviously, Jason, you, you get a close up look at, at this Canada team at present. Um, you know, what, what is it like working with this generation of players and, and what you're seeing and, and what the future could hold? You know, I, I, I look at the group now and, and under the leadership of John Herdman, who's put a, a comprehensive plan in place and is leaving no stone unturned. Um, I've, I've said this before, I've never been more excited about the future of the men's game and, and what this team could do. Uh, you know, hosting in 2026 is obviously down the road. But we're looking at 2022, and I yeah. know John is, and the players are firmly looking at 2022 to qualify outright, to get to a World Cup, to win in a World Cup. You know, we're, we're no longer just happy to participate. You know, this is about setting the bar high uh, for this generation, but also for the next generation. And that, that excites me. I get chills just thinking about it. Um, it. It's really exciting for the future of the game in our country. People are starting to ask the question, is this the best left back in the world right now? I mean, he's he's that good. Uh, you know, your thoughts on Alfonso, seeing a great young Canadian talent like Alfonso Davies, you know, what is what is yeah. that like for you to, to see that? Well, it's amazing. And it, and it just proves uh, as well that, uh, you know, dreams can come true for somebody like Alfonso because you know about his story, being sure. born in a, in a refugee camp uh, in Africa, making his way across. His parents have always been really positive about his upbringing too. And, never talk too much about that, but it, it is a, a, an opportunity that uh, our immigration system gave him uh, and his family. He's embraced it. Uh, he's a great individual. Uh, just the fact that we talk about him being as one of the best left backs or the best left back in the world at this stage of his career is just mind-blowing. And, and I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve because I think he is in that conversation. So quickly this has happened. Uh, gone from the Whitecaps where people knew him to Bayern Munich to breaking into the side that perhaps had one of the best last left backs in the world. <laughs> right. uh, injuries gave him that opportunity. He hasn't missed a beat. He looks like a star player. He's lightning fast. Um, it's just incredible rise. And I think it also that it helped playing that Champions League game in England against Chelsea where he demolished them on that day. So all of a sudden the media, world media started to pay attention outside of just Germany about who is this Alfonso Davies? Where is he from? What they wanted to know about him. Gary Lineker's doing stories on him and whatnot. So that gave him some great exposure. German league was back before any other league. So people were watching Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. He was lighting it up. Um, yeah. So, you know, he's playing for Canada. It's exciting times. We have some other really young, young mm -hmm. exciting players as well. I doubt that he's coming out of Belgium going into Lille, which is an interesting move for him. I think he's going to be playing a lot. So there's some pressure now on Canada to to maybe qualify for, for, for 22 uh, and not just get the gift of 26. And uh, I think those players are looking at 22, not looking at 2026 because you know, that's a lifetime in football. Just try to make the most of the next opportunity because we don't really know exactly how this play is going to play out. But it's for anybody to, to go to the World Cup and Canada has the team and the ability certainly to do it.
you know, on behalf of CONCACAF, thank you so much for for joining us here today. Really, it's been fun, you know, going back and, and looking at this tournament. Make sure you're watching on the CONCACAF YouTube and, and, and Facebook and also on the CONCACAF app if, if you're out and about somewhere. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. And take care. Have all the best. And I'll be watching. And uh, if you ever need me again, don't hesitate. Thanks very much for having us.